All right. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar. Thank you for joining us. Enhancing data protection workflows with Canister and Argo workflows. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand over to Ivan Sims, software engineer, and Michael Cade, senior global technologist, both with Kasten by Veeam. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee, but you can give us messages and send questions through the chat box on the right hand side of the screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there. We'll get to as many as we can at the end um, or as the speakers see fit as we go. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording will also be made available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand things over to Ivan and Michael to kick it off. Thanks. Thanks, Lippi. Uh, let me share my screen here. So can you all see my slides? Yeah, we can see. Okay, cool, awesome. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to be here. Uh, so it's good to be able to talk to you today. So yeah, um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Ivan Sim. I'm open source uh, software engineer at Casting. And uh, joining me today is Michael Kate, senior technologies from Casting. So today we will be talking about data protection workflows. So we're going to start off by um, talking a little bit about running stateful workloads on Kubernetes and why we would want to do that. Then from there, we will have a brief introduction into Kubernetes um, container storage interface, also known as uh, CSI, and how data protection fits into CSI. Then we'll share with you um, some of the challenges that we have heard from our users who have tried to implement their own data protection workflows. From there, we will introduce you to Canister, an open source project by Kasten that you can use to implement and curate your own data protection workflows on Kubernetes. After that, we'll dive straight into demo. And there are two parts to this demo. During the first part, we'll show you how you can use Canister to uh, implement a data protection workflows to interact with the CSI snapshot APIs. After that, we start during the second part of the demo, we show you how you can scale out these um, data operations to run in parallel by using um, Canister and Argo workflows. Towards the end, um, we'll make sure there are some times for Q and A. So, why run stateful workloads on Kubernetes? During the early days of Kubernetes, many of us were told to use Kubernetes to primarily run like um, stateless workloads even though Kubernetes came with a collection of um, APIs and constructs to support like stateful workloads. So we're talking about going back to the days of um, pet sets before it, it was even called like stateful sets. And we, back then we were told that when it comes to stateful workloads, we would be better off to use like our managed um, data services. And fast forward to today, many things have changed, especially in the past uh, year or two, we have seen an increasing trend in users uh, running and scheduling their stateful workloads to run directly on Kubernetes. Why did they do that? And why are we doing that? <clears throat> um, so for one, like, uh, we like control over the compute specification. May it be compute size in terms of CPU or memory um, um, specifications or IOPS and everything and anything in between, it really boils down to cards. And we also like to utilize and depends directly on the Kubernetes neutral API and we're not even talking about stateful work, workload related API. We're talking about scheduling APIs like part disruption budget, part um, affinity, anti affinity, resource requirements and limits, and load balancings, et cetera. For some of us, like um, we may have more uh, stricter requirements on the at rest encryption to be used for our data. And they might also like um, stricter like, um, data sovereignty regulation that we need to comply with. At the end of the day, it really boils down to like um, who and how, how and where we um, 
handle and store our valuable customers' data, and who owns like um, the uh, the backup artifacts of all this data. You know, if our databases were deleted, would still all these backup artifacts still accessible and, and exportable and importable? And more directly relevant to this talk is um, a neutral data protection strategy. So when we use like our managed data services, inevitably like um, our data protection strategy would be like um, coupled to the stack, the API, the libraries of um, the providers. Now this is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it really boils down to like the, you know, our use cases and our requirements. For some of us, like um, such direct um, dependency may be okay, but some of us maybe not so. And even from, from, from talking to our users, like uh, one of the things that they did share with us about running stateful workloads is like uh, they regain that visibility and control into the upgrade mechanism. And in cases where things fail during an upgrade, the recovery and the rollback is um, is something that they may have control of, like you know when they uh, you know run like um, stateful workloads themselves on Kubernetes. So what has changed between those early days when we were told to use Kubernetes for stateless workloads only to today, where you know more and more of us are starting back to starting to use um, Kubernetes to host and schedule our stateful workloads. While there are many factors, we think like it really boils down to these two or three like um, contributing um, um, and topics here. The emergence of operator pattern has helped us out a lot in terms of automations of the installation, deployment, and day two operations of um, data services and databases. And if we think about it, it makes sense, right? One of the main goals of an um, operator is to be able to encapsulate all this um, specialized knowledge we have about the applications, about the data services, and codify them and automate them and be able to share them with um, the, the rest of the team, with the rest of the community. And like um, there has also been tremendous like um, continuous growth and improvement of um, the Kubernetes container storage interface, also known as CSI. We talk more about CSI in the next slide. And we as a community, we have grown so much in terms of our experience and our expertise with um, running and managing like um, cloud native stateful workloads. Compared to the early days, um, we as a community are now more confident in our ability to debug like um, containerized um, stateful workloads and manage them. And like um, spoiler alert, like um, if we are using managed data services, underneath it, like um, this data managed um, this managed data services are probably running on Kubernetes. So depending on how you look at it, there might be benefits in knowing like um, how Kubernetes um, schedule and run stateful workloads, even though like um, if we choose not to um, do it ourselves directly. So. It's almost impossible to talk about running stateful workloads on Kubernetes without talking about CSI. So CSI is a standard um, of like API specification used to expose like um, storage solutions to containerized workloads on orchestration systems like Kubernetes. So it works really well on, on Kubernetes. It also works on like other orchestration systems like Cloud Foundry and Nomad. So CSI primarily manages like volume lifecycle with out of tree CSI drivers. Within the CSI framework, there is a collection of um, optional sidecar containers uh, managed by the CSI community. And this sidecar containers, they basically encapsulate common storage operations that you can embed and bundle with your CSI drivers. So for example, if you are a storage providers and you have like a, a collection of um, storage features you want to expose to your users, you will implement your CSI drivers. And then you will go to these um, collections of um, sidecar containers and pick and choose and bundle them with your um, CSI drivers um, to expose the kind of features that you want your users to have um, access to. And upstream, like um, within the Kubernetes community, there have been a lot of effort and push towards like moving away from the entry like um, volume plugins that come with Kubernetes to all these like um, out of tree CSI drivers. And some of the benefits of this, um, this push is pretty clear, right? Like, um, so um, for example, like um, we as users and implementers, we are able to test and maintain and upgrade and grow the CSI drivers outside of like, um, the release cycles of the Kubernetes core. 
Now, some of us might already be familiar with CSI. For those of us who are fairly new to it, I want to just share some quickly some useful features within the CSI framework uh, that includes like um, volume expansion, like um, resizing of the volumes via the PVC API, snapshotting of volumes, cloning of volumes, and initializing volumes with um, initial data using data populators. And uh, more recently, like uh, we have also seen like um, CSI driver that is capable of mounting secrets from your secret stores into your running workload uh, via like um, CSI volumes. Now, where does data protection fit in in all of these? Uh, well, within the SIGGAM storage, there is a working group that um, focuses on data protection. Last year, the group um, published a white paper on data protection workflows. And within the white paper, the group described like some uh, relevant data protection features, including backing up of volumes, change block tracking to enable faster and more efficient backups, queers and unqueers hooks of your database applications, groupings of volumes and snapshots, and uh, API to interact with remote backup repositories so you can export your backup um, artifacts to, and um, this API to snapshots and backup applications. So if data protection is like um, relevant to the thing that you do on a daily basis, I encourage you to join like um, the Slack channel of the working group uh, in the Kubernetes Slack. And I have also shared like um, the link to the white paper. So like feel free to download it and give it a read um, at your own leisure. So why bother with data protection? Why talk about data protection on Kubernetes today? Um, last year, uh, the CNCF survey report um, shows that like 64.69% um, of its respondents said that they were either already running stateful applications in containers in Kubernetes, or they are planning to shift <clears throat> and migrate their stateful workloads to run on Kubernetes. So that, again, that has been the increasing trend uh, for the reasons we discussed earlier. And when we as a community, also noticed that in the past couple of years, like um, the infrastructure, uh, the architectures and the toolings um, and the support around like cloud native infrastructure and application architecture have grown and changed quite a bit over the past couple of years. Whereas things related to data protection, the architecture, the, the toolings, uh, all the support around it has fallen behind. And we want to change that. And finally, like um, one thing that we really like about Kubernetes is that it and it provides like um, a set of APIs, uh, a set of common APIs that different teams and different verticals within an organization can use to to manage resources and enforce policies. And we feel like data protection solutions should be managed the same way. So, in other words, like um, there shouldn't be like um, a repositories of YAMLs for your for our microservices and policies and all those things. Whereas the data protection um, tools and scripts are in this separate like um, repositories in different format, you know, with who knows who have um, credential access to them. So we want to be able to find a way to bring them together using a cohesive like um, cloud native tools and APIs. And from talking to our users who have attempted to implement their own data protection workflows, we heard some of the challenges that um, they have encountered. At the end of the day, it really boils down to like the, diff the different requirements, the different strategies around snapshots and backups that different teams uh, with different experience and different scope may, may have different requirements on. For example, if you are someone who works on the platform team and you work closely with the cloud infrastructure, you might have um, APIs and tools that allow you to uh, um, automate the snapshotting of the virtual disk that are attached to your nodes. So keep in mind that the snapshot captured at this level is usually um, crash level consistent only. So in other words, it means that data that has been um, persisted to disk gets snapshot. Whereas um, data in memory or sometimes data in TEMFS, they may or may not be included. Now, again, depending on your requirements, like um, that and your use cases, that may or may not be important to you. And as we move up the stack to the data services, to the specific databases, to our microservices, um, 
we might have like um, different sort of scripts to um, freeze and unfreeze some um, the data service layers. We might have scripts that utilizes um, you know utility tools like um, MySQL dump or PG dump, and all of this like um, require like direct access into your production databases, right? Like how are they currently being managed? Who do you know? Um, who have access to what? And which versions which the team are using? Overall, there are just way too many moving parts. And the analogy that we like to use is like, imagine yourself being a barista it's like, um, with all these like, um, lists of coffee types and uh, on, on, the, on the menus, with each with its own like, ingredients and recipes that you have to memorize in order to put together like, um, the, the, the coffee that your, cons cons uh, your customer and consumer may ask of you. So just way too many things to remember and um, just you know, way too many ways that things can go wrong. So this is where we hope like um, Canister can come in to help you to uh, implement and streamline your entire data protection workflows. So I'll let Michael um, talk us through like um, the internals of Canister. Yeah, cheers, Ivan. And I, I think I think the so the story that Ivan tells around data protection, specifically around Kubernetes, this isn't a new like phenomenon at all. It's this has been the sa the same requirements around data protection, whether we look at other platforms, virtualization, physical systems. There's no shining on any particular platform that gets rid of that 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 boring talk around backup. We still need to do it. Um, in particular, when we think about data services, databases, Mongo, Postgres, etc., they still require that that uh, data protection, and it's how far into those those areas that that Ivan touched on is really where, like, how how much hand holding does it need through the process of protecting that data? Is a crash consistent copy going to be good enough in the light of some sort of fire, flood, blood type? Um, disaster almost to get our database back up because most of the time these databases are called like they're holding mission critical information in our environments um okay so i wanted to really hone in on well why what what canister is but also the why um granted everything that ivan also talked about so the application consistency etc can all be achieved via scripts via like being able to hone in on a particular data service and be able to script that to the point that you get a copy of the data either via a snapshot or via an export a tar file that gets exported out into object storage but that just involves you knowing a bit more about a bit more things when it comes to kubernetes we already know that the the ramp up from a, a kubernetes engineer kubernetes administrator is already big enough like there's already big topics around networking around storage in itself around all all other areas of kubernetes so really what canister does is kind of hit the easy button and takes away some of that that knowledge you don't really need to know everything about everything when it comes to protecting those potential mission critical um uh, data services so if we think about what canister is it's uh, an open source project uh, maintained um, by Kasten, who are focused on Kubernetes backup, but part of a wider um, company called Veeam. Veeam Software have been around for 15 years protecting virtual machines, physical SaaS-based workloads, etc. So, and really what Canister is, is the focus on that application data set. That application, whether it be Postgres, MySQL, I'll show you in a second, like the long, vast amount of blueprints that are already created that are out there in the community but really canister from a blueprint point of view or from an integration point of view could be anything uh, in terms of protection so really think of it as a way as an open source project that enables us to take application consistency or application level um, copies of that data export that move that wherever that needs to go um, again abstracting away that tedious the tedious detail so we don't need to worry about maintaining scripts or specific people scripts or or the process around that this gives us a way of being able to define what what we want to do how we want to do it and making that happen um when um canister is deployed and 
we'll go through some of that that process but it's it's implemented it's deployed within your kubernetes cluster acts as that kubernetes controller so it already already integrates into that kubernetes api so it allows us to embed ourselves into the kubernetes api and take advantage of all the good stuff there and then this brings us back the extensibility of canister i've mentioned some of the um like off the shelf or the community driven blueprints that we have the mysql's the postgres's but really we can they we can create a blueprint for any data service that is available and we do that via these functions um, that are built into the, into the controller. So if we go next slide, Ivan. But if we just take one, two or two steps back and we start thinking about, okay, what does canister look like in terms of what can we do? So first of all, we have a blueprint. I've mentioned that a few times. Now, if we think of a blueprint is a set of a set of instructions of, well, this is how I want to perform actions on a specific application. So. Again, we'll go back to like MySQL or Postgres, and this will say, I want you to pause the, the IO to our database. I want you to leverage a PG dump, and I want you to then export that out into, into object storage. Then what an action set then does is actually, okay, how do we make this happen? How do we instruct the controller to make that? Then give us that output. Um, as to whatever that may be. So the action set is the, let's go and do it. It's the, it's the trigger. And then we think about a profile as in, where do we want to store that data, that R file or that export of that data? So three simple um, mechanics of what Canister does and how, it, how, it, how we use that. Now also, so an action set, think of that as a backup, but also think of that as a restore. So we'd have a restore action set, a backup action set, and I think Ivan will, will touch on some of those other areas as well as we as we as we walk through um, the demonstration in a in a little while. If we go next slide. So yeah, some of those canister functions, and this is just a small um, snapshot of the amount of functions that we have within Canister. And in particular, that the demo that Ivan's going to show is very much focused around using the create CSI snapshot, restore CSI snapshot. But it's also worth noting as well, like we're seeing more and more customers that may be using Kubernetes. And this goes back to that stateless argument that, that Ivan spoke about, but where they're using or where you're using PaaS-based services such as Amazon RDS, where you're going to store your mission critical databases. So Canister has the ability to go outside of the cluster and be able to also capture that data as part of that process. Now, I don't believe we're going to show that in the demo, but I know that Vivek and other other maintainers of the project have done various other CNCF webinars that specifically go into that that RDS piece as well. So these are just some of the the arguments that we have within each of those canister functions that enable us to um, perform specifics when it comes to things like CSI or RDS that you see on the on the screen. So. There's a lot more canister functions. You can see that in the docs.canister.io. Um, and basically, these are all, all Go. Everything's written in Go from a canister perspective. So if we go next slide, Ivan. So if we think about the architecture, so canister is deployed via Helm into our Kubernetes cluster. And then we have this long list of blueprints that we can choose. So if you know what, what application or what data service you're using, you can see here that we have um, Cassandra, Elasticsearch, probably one, uh, I've done a session as well from a CNCF point of view on Elasticsearch, being that like forgotten stateful workload that might live within your Kubernetes cluster, capturing all of that, that logs and the metrics around that. Do, how important is that to the business? Do we need to protect that? And do we need to protect it in a, um, an application consistent fashion? So we've got that blueprint that will allow you to take that copy of that data, but equally be able to restore that to that specific application consistent point in time as well. And you can see others in there, Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, et cetera. And this list has actually grown over the last couple of months with the community contributing back into, into, these, um, into these blueprints. Okay, so we've got two, two factors here. We've got our controller that's deployed as part of the, uh, into our Kubernetes um, cluster. And then we have a list of blueprints that are purely focused on our application and our data services within that application. If we go to the next slide, please, Ivan. And then to trigger that, we have then 
a an action set. Now I mentioned about an action set being a backup or restore, but really that could be anything to verify or validate uh, uh, anything that we've done throughout the blueprint or to trigger that blueprint, the set of instructions that we've defined in the blueprint. So if we go next slide again. So basically the controller is sat there and it's watching and waiting for an action set to be implemented or, or pushed into the, the, the Kubernetes environment. And then it says, okay, found that we want to, we want to use this blueprint for that specific data set. Then we trigger that canister function, which is an exec function to the database or the data service in general to say, this is what I want you to do. And this is how I want you to play that. I want you to play through these steps. And I think the next slide or a few slides is an example of what that looks like. Uh, and then export those artifacts out. So whether that's a PG dump into a tar file or MySQL dump into a tar file, et cetera, we can export that out into an object storage location, for example. Uh, next slide. Um, so, and then we update what that looks like from an action set point of view, which gives us the ability to, to see the success rate of that, of that um, action set that we triggered. And next slide. Ah, so, and if we think about what a restore looks like in terms of that, but just before we go to the, the demo, which Ivan will actually show this, is um, obviously from a restore action set, it's still, the controller is still waiting for the action set to trigger and then, but then we're going to be pulling back the data from the remote storage into that database workload. But what Ivan, I think is going to show is the ability to push that into a different location as well. So think about not only are we talking about back and recovery of these applications, but think about a use case where we need to copy that data and potentially expose that to a separate namespace. Think about for testing and cloning and, and leveraging that data is another use case that could be used here. And all whilst simplifying that, like we're not complicating things by having to write these bespoke scripts for our for our application. So with that, I'll hand it back over to uh, to Ivan to to get into the into the demo. Yeah, thanks, Michael. <clears throat> so yeah, earlier like um, I talked about, there will be two parts to this demo. And we will be doing the demo on an EKS, AWS on EKS cluster. And on the cluster, we have a Postgres um, database installed, uh, which has like um, PVC and PV attached to it. And it's backed by an actual EBS volume. So during the first part of the demo, I'll show you how you can use Canister to interact with uh, the CSI endpoint on Kubernetes and manage that the volume snapshot and volume snapshot content resources from there and to actually initiate um, the creation of an EBS um, snapshots in the AWS um, space. So I am going to switch over to my terminal. And um, if I do a kubectl get pod in my PG, PG SQL namespace, you can see that I have a uh, Postgres um, pod managed by a stateful set workload running. If I uh, run kubectl exec into the same pod and pass in like a select star um, SQL query, you can see that I have some test data preceded into the database. And this data is um, what we are going to um, snapshot and restore later. Now I also have um, canister deploy in the canister namespace. And within the same namespace, I have a blueprint called CSI snapshot. So let's take a look at what um, uh, the CSI snapshot blueprints look like. As uh, Michael mentioned earlier, blueprint is a custom resource definition that comes with canister. Within a blueprint, we have a collection of action. So line two here show a create snapshot action. If I go further down to line 47, there is a described snapshot action. And towards the lower half of the screen, you see a restore snapshot action. So all in all, this, this, this one blueprint tells Canister, this is how you create and restore and list all the um, EBS um, snapshots via the EBS um, CSI driver. 
Um, so within each action, we have um, faces. Let me scroll down a little bit. Um, a face is a step. It's an atomic um, step that canister would execute. A step is backed by a canister function. So the first phase here basically talks about like I'm um, putting my Postgres database into read-only mode. And um, it's backed by a canister function called kubeexec. Underneath like um, this fu canister function is a bunch of Go code that uses the same packages that kubectl exec use to stream like um, remote command execution and to stream like output back from the pods. And the second phase here is a lot shorter um, in, in terms of its YAML. And um, it basically calls into a canister function called create CSI snapshot. Again, underneath it, as you can imagine, it's a bunch of Go code that uses client Go to interact with um, the CSI volume snapshot and volume snapshot content um, APIs. So let's take a look at the um, action set that we are about. So we look at the blueprint. The next thing we want to do is actually use an action set to trigger um, the create snapshot action. And we're going to use an action set called um, snapshot create. Uh, YAML is pretty um, relatively short, um, it's pretty simple. Basically tell Canister to go and find this blueprint called CSI snapshots. And within the blueprint, there will be a create snapshot action. So execute that and pass in like um, a bunch of like um, input parameters into that functions. So we're going to go ahead and create that. And then now we can quickly examine the, um, the status stop resource of the action set that we just created. If I scroll down to the lower half of the screen, you will see the status sub resource of the action set um, is being populated with um, real time state um, face state information uh, by canister. You can see like um, within the two faces, like uh, we was we successfully put the Postgres database into read only mode, and then now we are you know talking to the CSI APIs to say hey go and create a volume snapshot and the volume snatch our content resources. Now, if we were to take a quick look at the resources, you can see that like um, the volume snapshot resources was created um, just less than a minute ago. And under the ready to use column, Kubernetes is telling us that, hey, your snapshot is ready. Your EVS snapshot is ready. Now, Kubernetes thinks that you know the, the, the snapshot is ready, but is it really? I think the best way for us to verify is to actually talk to the um, AWS API and confirm that the snapshot was um, indeed created. Now, I'm going to run the get blueprint command again. And then if we go back to line 47, uh, oops, you will see that like um, under the described snapshots actions, we essentially uses the AWS um, CLI to talk to call to talk to the EC2 EBS um, snapshot API and say, hey, go find like um, the snapshots that we just created for this particular EBS volume that I know is attached to my Postgres database. Now, for demonstration purposes, like um, I just you pass in like um, all these um, bash scripts here. Um, just for visibility, you know, in a real serious environment, you probably would, um, you know, just curate and add your own like um, container image there to do all these things. The important thing is also to show that we can pass in like um, secret um, re references to secret resources from that already exists um, on our cluster. So cool. Um, now I want to execute that um, describe snapshot action. So to do that, the first thing I would need to do is get hold of the EBS like um, volume ID. So what this command did was uh, it looked into the PV uh, that is attached to my Postgres database and get the actual volume ID so that we can pass it into our describe um, snapshot action set. Let me just um, copy and paste this over here. So essentially what this did was um, the 
we pass into we pipe into kubectl create um, an action set that is very similar to the first action set we use to create snapshot. We say go to blueprint CSI snapshots and run this describe snapshots function. And here's the volume ID that I wanted you to use. Now, if we take a look at the um, status um, sub resource of the action set that we just created, we will see that we actually got response back from the AWS um, API. It just said, yep, I recognize this EBS volume. And yes, you had a snapshot that you just created um, not too long ago. So there. Um, Kubernetes said our snapshot is ready and AWS API confirmed that, you know, hey, this is a uh, snapshot is also ready. So this goes back to what Michael talked about earlier. Like, um, you know, with basically with um, canister blueprint, you can use it to do many, many more things um, in addition to backup and restore. Now, the last thing that we need to do is really just to um, restore the EBS snapshot that we just created to a new instance of Postgres database. And um, to do that, I need to get hold of the um, actual create um, snap action set ID. Now, instead of pasting, copy and pasting like a bunch of YAML that like I just did, I use this tool called CanCTL to create the restore snapshot action set. The interesting thing here is like I'm able to tell CanCTL that says, hey, use the previously um, deployed action set as the parent or as the base of this new action set. So I pass in the dry run option just so that we can get a sense of what the YAML looks like. Now, if we look here, the um, again, very familiar um, YAML properties, blueprint is CS I snapshot, run this restore snapshot action, pass in a bunch of um, input parameters, and in addition to that, use this um, artifacts. So the concept of, of artifacts is like, uh, so when the create action set snapshot um, finish earlier, it has like a, a bunch of um, return values and outputs that got stored in this um, status um, sub resource. So CanCTL was able to go into that status sub resource and re read like um, re read and these some um, out return values and inject it into my restore action set and use that as input so that, you know, I don't have to like uh, figure out, okay, which, what were the return values that I got back from the CSI endpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and pipe this into um, kubectl and create this. Okay. And let's take a look at the um, restore snapshot resource. If I can scroll down to the lower half of the page, there's only one face here, um, which calls the restore snapshot um, function and the state is completed. So cool. So if I have done it correctly, then we should be able to see a new PVC in the PG, PG SQL namespace. So that's the one that we just created. So you can see like I was 30 seconds old. So the first um, PVC is attached to our original Postgres database. This is backed by the PV and the EBS with the original data that we snapshot. Now the restore PVC is something that um, Canister just created via the CSI API based on the EBS snapshot that we just created a couple of minutes ago. Now this new PVC is going to stay in the pending status until like a new Postgres um, part or instance is deployed. And that's exactly what we're going to do next. Um, we're going to use Helm to install like um, a separate instance of um, Postgres database into the same namespace. Um, the only thing to, to pay attention to here is like, yeah, we are telling um, that the, the, the scheduler or the stateful scheduler to, hey, reuse the existing PVC that we just restored don't create a new one based on your volume um, template spec. So hit enter. And then like Helm is going to go do his things. And then if we watch the um, pot and the PVC, we will see that now the restore PVC is actually bounded to the pot because now there is an actual consumer to, to use it. 
and then our restore Postgres database is coming online. And um, if everything works according to plan, I should be able to keep cut exact into it to see like um, the data that we just restored. Um, so there it is. This is uh, we we exact into the restore part, and then like this is the data that we um we managed to restore um from our EBS um snapshot, and you probably are already noticed right all of these like uh, without um our user needing to know anything about CSI endpoint needing to know about how to work with client go and, and stuff like that so just YAML manifest and that canister like um do all the low level like um heavy lifting for you now the um second part of this demo is pretty straightforward all we're gonna do is repeat the same um data operation backup um uh, and then uh, and then like um, let Argo workflows like scale that out to run in parallel so that we can mo snapshot multiple instances of Postgres um, at the same time. So I want to show you what the workflow YAML looks like. So this is an Argo workflow YAML. The trick is that um, I'm able to pass in a list of um, stateful set workloads um, in to, to, the work, to the workflow and say, so go to this namespace, the three namespaces and find all these stateful set and do the operation that I'm gonna tell you inside the template. If you scroll down into the workflow template, we scroll down to the execution step. Um, it's really just using can CTL and say, now go ahead and create like action set for all these different, um, um, this, all these different Postgres database here. And then I can use the um, Argo CLI to submit the workflow YAML to um to to Argo and let it like do its thing there. Argo, so, like, what? sorry, well, mm -hmm. I know that that something happens there. So um, obviously that's massively important because not all of our applications are a single front end container with a back end database or data service. Nine times out of ten, your application, especially in a microservice, is built up of many different data services. So being mm -hmm. able them all in one succinct kind of like like workflow that's what the benefit here of, of incorporating something like Argo workflow into is is an allowing us to have group consistency across multiple data services or at least um talking to multiple data services at once yeah absolutely and just um spot on michael like um you know like just like um use, using like uh, Argo to to help us to like, um, cause like um, the main thing here is with canister, uh, it is a data protection workflows. It comes with all these data protection functions. Now, when it comes to more sophisticated like workflow concepts, like running in parallel, like scheduling, retries, error handling, we can try to build all of this into canister or we can just utilize like a really cool project like Argo workflows, uh, which is a more generic like um, uh, workflow engine you know, to, and, and top, use them together um, to, to, to provide that really cohesive like um, integration. Good point. Um, so yeah, you know, if we were to just take a look at the <clears throat> volume or the CSI resources, um, we could see that like um, they have all, the snapshots have all been created um, by Argo workflows um, run, running in parallel um, in the, across the different namespaces. So again, all of this without us having to manage like uh, different um, bash scripts or make files, passing in different parameters or giving, giving different teams, different users, different credentials access. So yeah, I think that's pretty much <clears throat> the demos. Um, before summing up, like Michael, is there anything you want to add? No, I think we've just covered a uh... A hell of a lot, right? We just went into a 101 of what Canister is and what it does and why. Um, hopefully, it simplifies that that application focus around data protection. Um, and then we obviously showed you how that looks and how how it works, and then also incorporated that or integrated that into another open source project such as Argo Workflow that allows us to um, 
not only orchestrate some of that some of that data protection, but also allow you to uh, hit multiple uh, applications or data services at one at the same time, whilst also being able to schedule that. So I think mm -hmm. that's a summary that I'll give, but I know this is this is pretty important to us and the community as well because this is a growing community for us, um, and it's really the community that enables us to advance what we're doing from a from a canister point of view um yeah with what we're trying to do but i'll let you 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 do the uh the talk track here <laughs> yep sure yeah so yeah um you know if you are currently planning and designing like um, a data protection workflows to protect your data consider checking out canister um the source code is on github and we also have a slack channel uh we do come by our drop by our community meeting, which happens on every other Thursday at um, four o'clock afternoon UTC time. Come by and say hello. We'd love, love to meet you over Zoom. And yeah, they have some like um, new exciting features and roadmaps coming up. You know, come in and share with us your use cases. And uh, you know, we want to help to want to hear about what you what your 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 vision of a data protection workflow engine looks like. You know. Um, and build something that actually works for you and help you out. And of course, like of course, like, we all welcome like um, contributions for sure. And that's it. Um, I think we have time for questions. Are there any questions? Doesn't look like um, it, Ivan, but. Obviously, yeah, if anyone on and anyone has any questions, please uh, please drop them in the chat. We'll we'll be happy to to answer them. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Cool. Yeah, I cool. All right. Do you all want to drop any Slack channels or Twitter handles into the chat in case anyone has some follow up they think of later? Yeah, I can share the. Um... There you go. I think I just put the Slack in there, canisterio.slack.com. Yep. Yep. And you all can also like um, find me and Michael on Twitter. Feel free to DM, DM us if you have questions about data protection. Love to hear from you. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, right. everyone. Well, if there are no questions, thank you so much, Ivan and Michael. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Remember, this will be on demand shortly, um, and you can find it either on our YouTube playlist on the website or via this link. And thank you both so much for joining us. We'll see you all again at the next live webinar. Thanks, Lippy, for hosting. Cheers. Of Bye. Course. Thank you. Bye.